All right, my friends, welcome again to the Josh Scanlon Podcast. Got an exciting uh, interview today with Rajiv Ribello, who I came across on an article on uh, Kitsis.com. And for any of you all who are familiar with the financial advisory industry, a guy named Michael Kitsis is uh, yet to be proven as a human being with all the stuff that he writes. I still think he's a robot. He, he says he has kids, and I, I believe that, but I'm not sure it's a... Uh, I don't know if, if he's not just someone else, you know, a guy behind the curtain, because this guy, Michael Kitts, is writes more than anyone could do while he's raising a family and running a business as well. Uh, but anyway, he uh, he he has his uh, a nerd's eye view uh, website, Kitsis.com. He does a podcast. And uh, just if you're in financial advisory, he, he anything Kitsis writes needs to be on your first read for sure. And if you're in a client as well. Um, and you're feeling you need education for whatever reason, uh, Michael Kitsis is your go-to guy. So long story short, I was way behind on reading the Kitsis stuff, and I came across this one on uh, that Rajiv had written on life insurance. And my own background is I was always a buy, term, and invest, the rest guy, and I come from the Vanguard School of uh, Economics, if you will. Um, and then I came across a client, and Rajiv, you'll find this interesting, that he had about $3.5 million cash value and a UL policy, universal life policy that was issued in the 1980s and had a guaranteed minimum interest rate of 5.85 from USAA. And so every year he was getting 5.85% tax-free on a roughly three and a half million with a $2 million death benefit on top of that. And he had, it was paid up. He put a hundred thousand dollars a year for 10 years in there in the early eighties to early nineties. And he was done. And I just, and I remember I saw that this in 2010, I said, man, I have been missing this my whole life because up to that point, I was always uh, thinking life insurance was sold, not bought, and that there's no reason to have it. So, Rajiv, welcome to the podcast, man. I cannot wait to hear what you got to tell us and uh, your story. So uh, just take a few minutes, if you would, tell us who you are, who you work for, what you do, and we'll, we'll just go from there. Sure, sure. Yeah, just th- thanks for having me. Um, you know, I'm always excited to talk about life insurance, even though most people aren't. Um, but it's kind of my uh, bread and butter. So I'll, I'll tell you why I'm excited to talk about life insurance. Yeah. Um, I'm an actuary by training. Uh, I actually, you know, used to price UL and DUL policies for, for New York Life and do a bunch of actuarial numbers and looking at statistics, how many people died versus what we expected, how many expect- we expected them to die. Um, so I did a bunch of analysis like that. Um, eventually, I wanted you know kind of more exciting and fulfilling things. Um, and, and on top of that, I was looking at the numbers. And when you actually look dive into these products, you see that you know the agent gets 100% of the first year commission, and then you know within 10 years, 50% of the people cancel the policy. And oftentimes, they face huge surrender charges. So you can pay hundreds of thousands of dollars into these products and then cancel it and get nothing back. Um, which is horrible. This is kind of, again, it was great for the insurance company because you yeah. pay a bunch of premium, I pay about the agent, and I don't have to pay a death benefit because you canceled it and you get nothing back because I ate it all up in surrender charges. So I was looking at this as better ways to do that. This is not being done correctly. Um, and so I went to work for a, a life settlement firm, which is essentially, look, instead of you canceling and getting nothing, right, we'll buy the policy from you and we'll hire actuaries like me to figure out, hey, how, how do we minimize premiums as opposed to maximizing them what the agent wants you to pay? And so I kind of, you know, I worked for them for, for quite a bit. Basically, again, instead of making it profitable for the insurance company, making it profitable for the the, the, the policy owner, yeah. which was the investor in this standpoint. So I did that for a number of years. You know, I was in, in New York. Um, they had a little investment firm. And so now I kind of came back to San Diego where I'm from. I started my own consulting uh, services. So the bulk of my work is still in the life settlement space. I do a lot of cool stuff there. Um, but I thought, you know what? I have all this expertise and understanding of life insurance and how to structure it and how to treat it as an asset, you know, to improve returns, but I'm doing it for the investors, for institutional groups. I can do the same thing for actual policy owners, you know, high net worth individuals who purchase life insurance and hey, how do you use these tax tax deferral benefits? How do you kind of structure it? How do you minimize premiums as opposed to maximizing it? What, What are better ways of doing this? And so I wanted to start working with fiduciary kind of advisors. Um, and that's, you know, kind of led to the Kitsis article, look, I want to put this out there, you know, about how to use insurance properly. And, and to your point, we were talking earlier, for most people, buy term and invest the difference is by far and away the best approach to take. But for that upper echelon of clients who are high income, right, who, who need to, to defer taxes, um, this is, this can be a great option, you know, um, especially that tax-free portion, you're looking to pass on to your, um, your, your, your heirs. So, 
again, there's great ways of using life insurance. That's kind of what I do. The bulk of uh, now here at Colva, um, uh, sorry, is on the life settlement side, but I'm branching out. I do a lot of consulting work. Again, a trustee will come to me with a policy. I'll review it and say, hey, this is what you should be doing. Have you thought about X, Y, and Z? This is how you can improve returns. So we really kind of focus on maximizing returns for the client. And because of my relationship is to the client, I'm not selling anything. It's, again, really my job is to, to improve the client's returns. And that's what I'm trying to do here, show people how to improve returns over what they could get, you know, elsewhere, um, whether within insurance or outside of it. it you're um, going back to, so the going back to your history of New York life, you were saying 50% of the people canceled their policies within 10 years after they already paid all the fees to the, the agent and the insurance. Like, so literally they got no benefit at all from the policy, it actually hurt them financially because... Correct, it, because they canceled it and they walked away, right? So it, essentially what they thought, if you think about it, well, what they essentially did doing is they bought a very, very expensive term policy because they kept it for, you know, under 10 years or five years, but they paid, but they paid, you know, 20 times as much. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, oh. And that's, well, that's, that's, that's the game. Why did they cancel? Because they couldn't afford it anymore? They didn't see the... I mean, I, that's, that is absolutely I'll, exactly what I was thinking. All those reasons. So, so you're, you're sold something, you buy it, you're excited. And a, co a couple years, you're getting older, your, your, your kids are, are, are kind of growing. Like, do I really need this? Why am I paying all this premium? What is the point of it? Um, and you cancel it. And again, the surrender charges eat up such a significant portion, especially in the early years, you know? So again, because it's sold, you, you kind of buy it without knowing. And that's why, again, fiduciaries really need to take ownership of this. Like, look, if you're getting life insurance, it should be a, through a fiduciary advisor who's advising you, like, look, this is the type of product, and this is why you should be getting it, and you're comparing it against a numerous products. But well, usually people buy life insurance on their own from some guy, and it's they're selling one product, you know, and right. that's the product apparently that's right for you, you know, so. How do you, so for you, Rajiv, I mean, do you, like, say, I'm representing Joe Schmo, he's my client. Uh, he has a policy he took out in 1997. Just let's use that for example. Do I do I say, hey, Rajiv, can you help me analyze this? And you know, obviously for a fee, but is that what you do, or do you? Correct. Actually yeah. So I do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, look, this is what. What, what is your goal here? Like, uh, you want to maximize the return on the policy? This is kind of how you do it. You just, let me show you how to minimize the premiums. You know, uh, and 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 improve the return. Um, if you're kind of like, look, uh, the death benefit return, if you like, look, I kind of want to take some of this out, you know, like I can show you how to take, use a loan and take out some of that, those proceeds as, as tax-free uh, income. You know, so there's cool kind of things you can do yeah. with it um, through, through loans. You know, it really depends on your goal. Like, what is your goal? Obviously, the best goal is to, to um, keep it, you know, and then give it to your heirs. Like, so you minimize the premiums. But some people, they kind of need the money now, so they want to take out some. You can kind of do cool things with that. Um, but yeah, there, there, there's interesting ways, uh, uh, interesting things you can do with it. So, how do you? I'm just curious because you're not work. Let's just use North New York Life example. So, Joe Schmo has got a policy in New York Life. You're not representing New York Life. How do you have access to the various? I mean, do they give you like a limited power of uh, a limited power of? Uh, uh, or how do you crunch all those numbers if you're not? Affiliated with so, New York Life, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, but I, the policy. There's numerous ways, and that you know. For one, the policy owner can request all the documents. I can say, here, here's all okay. the documents I need. Just gotcha. you can go and get them, or you can give me third party authorization and I, I can you. go and get them. Gotcha. Okay. Um, the problem is, if you ever work with a life insurance carrier, it's so it takes so long to go through this process. Yep. But again, that's that, that's what I do. You know, that's the worst part of my job is like contacting the carrier because I have to sit on for 20 minutes just on on hold. You know, it's horrible. Right, because um, they have no incentive to provide that info. To you yeah. The minute it's someone's asking, slow, for it just, that, they it, think it could be surrendered or something like that. Well, I mean, the, the, it's just it's, it's not as you know efficient. You know, the people are nice. Most you know, it's just they're slow and they're just, it's just not efficient. What? Let me ask. So another thing I want to ask you, and, and I want to go into this article because I think that art. I tell you, that article opened me up to so many different questions, which we're not going to have enough time to get involved. But I do want to ask you. Um, you know, working. I worked at USA for many years. USA is a good company. Love USA. Um, I always challenge their investment side of it. I think they're a little bit not as uh, as beneficial as maybe Vanguard, but from the insurance side, they're, they're fine. Um, but their policies are cash value oriented, not death benefit oriented. And if you would have asked me five years ago what the hell that was, I would have no idea. But now I do. <laughs> and so a lot of the old UL policies that they've written, they writ they wrote back in the late eighties, early nineties are going to blow up uh, before people do, if that makes sense. And, and I have a feeling it's not just USAA. I have a feeling there's a lot of underfunded policies that are really going to 
take people by surprise when they thought they were fully funded. Uh, what, any thoughts on that, uh, Rajiv, in terms of like, yeah? So, so, so let me explain a you know a couple yes. of things. Uh, and, and I'll make a distinction between universal life and, 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 and whole life here in a little bit. But basically, you know, if you're talking about people who bought policies in the 80s, you know, and in, in, in kind of early 90s, the interest rate environment was entirely different than it is now, right? So the interest rate was a lot higher, so they could afford to have higher crediting rates. And again, when they do the projection, when the actuaries did their projection, it's like, oh, it's going to be, you know, 7% for, for 30 years, you know. So we're basing all our assumptions on this. But what happened, right, obviously, is the interest rates, you know, were dynamic and change. And as they lowered, their portfolio returns started lowering. So now you're 20, 20 years out, you know, number, numerous things. First of all, you, you, you know, the interest rates have, have declined, right, relative to what you projected. But two, yeah. they were over aggressive on the pricing, right? So they, again, they designed it to, to sell products, you know, to sell, so agents could sell it. So they, you know, again, whatever the mortality risk was, they're like, ah, it's not that bad. Um, so now, you know, um, 20 years later, you know, they're having one of those two issues, either, you know, the, the mortality was kind of off or the, the interest rate um, assumption is no longer in, in, in valid. So they need to decrease the, it's called decreasing the current crediting rate. So it's, it's one of those two options or both. Yeah, um, so so you, you, if, if they decrease the, the interest rate, then it's usually tied to the, the performance of the, 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 their portfolio. If they increase the COI rates, then it's 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 re related to the fact that they didn't really price it the way they should have, and they now they need to make adjustments. And so those are the two reasons why you know again a policy owner was paying X amount of premium, and now they have to pay a lot more because the, the assumptions changed. Um, and so that is an issue. That is an issue with UL um, a, a policies versus whole life policies, where you kind of have a, 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 a kind of more you know a steady rate of return, uh, you know a guaranteed rate of return, but less upside. Yeah. Um, you also and you have less death benefit protection. So yeah. the UL side is like you can get a lot more death benefit protection and you have a higher upside in terms of gain because you're investing in higher earning assets. But this is the downside with regards to to, to interest rates on on the UL side. Well, and I just I find as a deal with a doctor in Philadelphia about uh, seven years ago, and I'll never forget he had eighty eight thousand dollars of cash value. He's only sixty eight years old on a million dollar death benefit, and um, and I ran an enforced illustration. And it was going to expire in, in uh, nine years. And he was, uh, to be honest, he was fit. He was pissed. He was fit to be tied. And I'll never guess a doctor, you know, show, show. Uh, the reason is just like what you said. And, and he said, when they illustrated this to me, that was not the case. They said I'd be essentially paid up and blah, blah, blah. And, I, you know, I told him he understood because I get it. But that's not the, the way it was illustrated to me in terms of when I walked out of there. And, and my concern, Rajiv, is I got a feeling there's a lot of people out there with these life insurance policies that they're completely ignorant about um, about what's going to happen here in three or four years if they don't come up with a whole lot of money or do something. Correct. And that's why, again, that's why it's important to have these policies reviewed right yes so especially if you're a high net worth individual look there's a lot of money in these policies even eighty eight thousand. that's a lot that's a decent chunk of change you know well, on top of um, all the money he put into it though i mean that's just yeah cash value now which is de de declining in front of our very eyes so i mean he put and, a lot and, and of so money those are, those are things that, that look like as he gets older depending on his health either you, you, you want to minimize the premiums to to, to 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 pay going forward so um or, or otherwise, then you look at alternatives like, look, you know, can I, you know, can I sell it? Can, can I sell this policy on the life settlement market? There's different options, you know. So I walk through with, with clients on that again in these situations. Oh, that's interesting. So, like, so you can yeah. actually advise or at least suggest life settlement things. So the options aren't just, you know, put another hundred thousand in there or let this policy Correct. last. But Correct. The, ah, okay, Correct. so you can also talk about, you know, what could happen if they did go to the life settlement market. Correct, correct, okay. and then so we can talk about how you know what what to be wary of there. Yeah, you can get a lot more than you can get on the um, by canceling it. You know, you can, but the issue is that you often pay, if you go through a broker, you pay a fifteen percent to thirty percent commission fee. So how do we avoid going through the broker? And then we can kind of talk about ways to do that. Oh man! So okay. it, it's again, yeah, it's a lot of consulting on, on, on that front. Um. So tell us about because uh, this part of your article that incredibly was uh, an eye opening to me was understanding before you purchase what you're trying to accomplish in terms of maximize cash value yeah. or maximize death benefit. They're two almost competing different entities. And I have a feeling a lot of agents or even fiduciaries don't recognize the difference and how important it is when you're designing life insurance policy. Can you can you go into that some, Rajiv? Yeah. So so I, I don't want to be overly complicated with, with you guys, right. but basically. 
there, there, there's two tests that, that determine whether uh, a, a policy um, qualifies as life insurance. One is called a guideline premium test, and the other one is called the cash value accumulation test, or see that. The first one is GPT for guideline premium test. The, the last one is see that. The guideline premium test is, 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 is simple in the sense that it really just limits the premium you can put into the policy. Um, the cash value accumulation test, it basically says, look, you can dump in an unlimited amount of premium, but if you do that, we're going to increase the death benefit. And the reason why they're increasing the death benefit is, again, because that increases your net amount at risk, and then the net, increased net amount of risk results in higher COI charges. So it, it essentially prevents people from using it as a pure kind of investment play, mm -hmm. uh, which is what happened in you know the, 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 the early 80s. But essentially, look, you know, as I showed in the article, the, the difference between using a, a GPT, which is for the cash value, and the CVAT, it's small. But what the CVAT does allow you to do, and why almost everyone should, should elect the CVAT, is it gives you that embedded option to like, hey, I can dump in a bunch of premiums later. So if yeah. I get sick, you know, and I want to, you know, and I can't afford life insurance, now I have an asset that can't. So in, in your cases, like you were talking before, you know, where, again, the interest rate is 5.85% and they're getting crediting rate. And again, depending on how they funded it, like there's, there is CUI charges being deducted. But if you minimize the, 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 um, the, the cost of insurance, like you can dump in a lot of premiums in that look. So maybe they're not, it's crediting 5.85%, but maybe they're really making 5%, which right. is really a strong rate, right, in, in today's, you know, instant money. Um, so you can dump in a lot. So that see that option, which people don't know about, allows you that embedded option. So the price of that embedded option is very low. So there's, you know, limited reason why you would you would choose the GPT over the see that. But the problem is the GPT is is usually the the the, the standard, right? Is every it's the default option. So you and, and not all policies allow the see that option. So you ah, really have to get, look. Yes. You have to look at the carrier and say, hey, can I do this the see that? And then. Your financial advisors should be like, look, this is what you should do. Look, you need like, why are you getting this policy? Like, if you were looking for, you know, exactly. deferred income, deferred growth, then look, buy a small policy and dump it a bunch later. Let me show you how that looks like. Um, this is what you could do. It's kind of similar to what I did in the article with like dumping in a lot. No, um, absolutely. But what's great now, what what I learned from uh, you know from doing that article, is there's no commission life insurance products now available. So you don't even need to do this thing of of, of buying a small policy and dumping in a lot later because the reason we're doing that is to avoid the early year expenses that come from commissions. But if there's no commissions, there's no surrender charges, and the expenses are low, so you can just dump it in a lot of money right away. Wait, wait, wait! Um, what was that? There are products now that allow that. There yeah. Are commissions. It, 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 so, so, so here's the business model, and it, it's great. It's kind of like a, 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 a direct to RIA business model. Like, look, we're not going through the agent. We're going to the RIA. And right. the RIA is going to educate their clients, and they're going to dump in a bunch of money, and the product's going to do great. And in, instead of us paying the, the, the agent uh, upfront commission, the RIA just charges their, their fee-only fee, right? They're, they're, they, they charge a financial planning fee, or they charge right. an asset under management fee. So let's say that thing's growing at 5% or, you know, or whatever it is, right? They're getting their 1% fee every year, right, on those assets. So it's, it's basically something that benefits both the client and the RIA. Obviously, we're taking the, the middleman, the broker, or the agent out of it, right? So there are products like that that really look good. And again, I'm trying to educate to kind of seminars, the advisors about that. I didn't know that. I mean, I, I knew there was a bugaboo in the insurance industry for RIAs, invest, you know, registered investment advisors or fee based, fee only financial planners, but I didn't realize. They had products that are now on in the market where they're not mm -hmm. commissioned at all. Correct. Oh, so that's it's, huge. There's super cool things in financial planning. Yeah, that's cool. That's what I'm trying to I'm trying to get in front of people, but it's tough. Well, yeah, that's, see, that's the issue, Rajiv. Is I always said that was one of the things with life insurance. I let my insurance license expire for all 50 states about two years ago because I I just didn't want to sell. I wanted you to be all 50 money. states, huh? Yeah, uh, when you work at USA here. <laughs> And Puerto Rico and D.C. So every year I got a thing from New Hampshire and Montana. And anyway, but so long story short, I said, but so I, when I became a fee only RIA, I said, I'll talk about life insurance. But until there's a non-commissions model, uh, we're not going to be able to implement this because someone's going to have to get paid, even though essentially I'm doing all the grunt work for the client. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. And uh. so. 
So, well, aren't you cool. glad you talked to me today? <laughs> well, I didn't know that, man. I, that is, I, I know Kitsis has been, you know, barreling on this for a long time about having non-commissioned things. And, and I, I, again, I'm a couple months behind on his podcast and whatnot, but this is fantastic. So what you're saying now is because like folks in his article, uh, he makes the case Rajiv does about n- avoiding the front end sales charge and surrender charges and all that with a minimal policy. Um, so you have a minimal policy and you're putting out uh, 10,000 bucks and something like that. But then like after year eight or something like that, when the commissions are behind you and a lot of the, the surrender charge are behind you, you're just dumping, we'll just say a million bucks. And essentially what happens is if it's a CVAT, your million dollars will give you a death benefit of 3 million bucks or something like that. And, and I, I'm not, I'm not doing it just how Rajiv pointed out, but that was wonderful. Cause that way you can avoid all the front end sales charge. Like Rajiv was talking about the first part of this con- conversation and yet you still get the benefit of your underwriting uh, for when you were today, even though it might be eight, nine, 15 years later is it right. it yeah. genius. I, I, I loved it, man. Um, but the issue of course was given that you're paying a significant uh, commission on the front end, you gotta be careful how much you pay on the front end, but now with, with fee only products. Yeah, yeah. Oh dude, that's fantastic. Mm, um, right. But again, going back, so I want to say, I think a lot of people and agents, they say, we're going to get you life insurance inherently. That means death benefit. And so they say, we're going to get you the max death benefit, but for more higher end people, I mean, the death benefit's fine, but the tax free growth of a, a good UL policy uh, that they can use with loans to fund retirement later on down the road, that has a benefit too. So at that point we might want to minimize the death benefit uh, to minimize the net amount of risk. Right. Is that, I mean, that's kind of what I learned from your article there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, it, it it really depends on your on your goals, and and it's it's one of those things that a financial advisor needs to to take into play. Like, look, I can invest in the product, and what what after tax return am I getting? Versus if I take that same money and I invest that in that same index, you know, if it's an index universal life, you know, outside the product, and then yeah, I pay taxes, but I don't have insurance fees, and then how does that compare, right? Like, so you really need to do an, an apples to apples comparison. Right. Um, Obviously, the other thing that, that that's really important to take into consideration is you can, you know, for, for the UL policies, you really want to take advantage of these loans and, and tax-free kind of growth, right? Again, you have to look at the loan rate and all this kind of stuff. Because just looking at the pure gains, if you just do a, a, like the gains you're getting in the product, those gains are taxed at ordinary income rates. So let's say I have the UL product investing in the S&P or some other equity index. If I were to invest outside of the, the, the insurance product, what happens? Well, I get long-term capital gains, which right. is very you know, low relative to my ordinary. But if I invest in that same index inside the insurance product, not only am I paying higher you know, insurance company fees that I wouldn't pay outside, the CUI and all that, I'm also now paying, I'm getting taxed at um, ordinary income rates. So again, it, it, you know, again this tax-free component is, 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 is valuable if you can structure it. It's, but it's also again you you want to pass on some money to your 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 heirs and you just you want some liquidity available. Um, so again, for the higher kind of income you know, people, it, you know, it can make sense. Um, it does make sense rather um, in, in certain cases. But you really have to kind of look at it, and, and you need a fiduciary financial advisor to kind of walk you through the complicated math. What um I'm so I'm curious. Like, let's just say I'm working with a client, and uh, you know, let's say it's a, a woman, you know, a, a high flutin doctor, and she's an anesthesiologist or something like that, a radi- mm, radiologist. Yeah. She make a big box, and she goes, "Look, you know, I want to leave uh, a, a pretty good amount of money to my kids, tax free. So life insurance, I, I like it, makes sense. Maybe to offset some of the taxes that they'll have to pay on their IRAs." Um, but, uh, you know, but I don't know what a CVAT is or a GPT and, and I don't either as a financial advisor. Um, so if they, you know, contact you Rajiv through their financial advisor, um, you, I mean, I, I never even heard of a CVAT to be honest. I know what a GPT was, yeah. but if someone said, I want to see that policy, I would have said, I don't even know what that means. And, you know, I've been in the business a long time. I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, the well, groups that offer this, like you can point them to these groups, these insurance agencies. Yeah, they yeah, I and mean, they they'll get it straight from the carrier. And like they they would just again if they want to consult with me, it's really on the minimizing the 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 the, the um uh you know maximizing the death benefit return on these tax strategies. I can also uh, assist and, and consult, but they'd be getting the product straight from the the carrier. The financial advisor would be charging their financial right. planning fee, you know, however whether it's a, a flat fee or whether it's an asset under management fee. 
Um, but let, let me give you an example to sure. say hey, when, when does this kind of make sense? Let's say you have a doctor. They're very conservative, right? You know, as doctors, people like they're sitting there and they're putting most of their money in bonds. So let's say they have a 50-50 split. Right? Yes. So yep. Fifty percent of the money is in split. They're, they're, they're scared. But what's the problem with the bonds? Because those bonds are making 4%. And your income, your marginal tax rate is like 45%. So yep. you're, you're making a lower rate and you're getting yep. taxed at a ridiculous rate. So why don't we find something where, you're again, you're not paying that every year 45% drag, right? Why don't we find something that makes sense and we can kind of structure solutions around that? And that's where we do things like yeah. this. Look, what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the death benefit, right? We're going to minimize the net amount at risk and we're going to dump in policies so you defer it. And it's an easy, like, compare what is your earning, you, your buy term and invest difference. We're doing that same analysis with, okay, we're going to buy the insurance product versus investing in bonds. What does it look like? No, oh, man. And you can I show that to a client. Completely agree. I, I man, I 100% agree with that without question. Um, the drawback was always having to get through the first, you know, five, six, seven years of commissions and surrender charge, but it seems like now. But you don't have to do that now. With the yeah, no, correct. You're right. Awesome. You still got to get underwritten. I mean, that's the issue. I mean, yeah, you still yeah. Go through underwriting. But, but again, so you go to, again, you, you know, you, you go to a bunch of carriers. Again, most carriers are going to give you the same rating, like, um, but you can go to, to, to multiple to see if you can get a slightly better one somewhere. But um, yeah, again, that's just part of being, you know, so part of going through the process. If the client and their advisor talks to you about that, though, you can know the policies on which to do all that. Like if they're trying to maximize, because I, I, I actually just did a YouTube video where bonds are bad because uh, I don't like bonds. I don't I, don't, I, I like income annuities. Um, absolutely. I don't like bonds, especially in retirement, because I just I don't. They, anyway, I won't get into it. And I do like life insurance as a cash value component over bonds because of just what you just said right there. Uh, but I don't know the first thing about how to design that or who even to go to. Yeah. You could guide people in that re direction, though. I guess we're ultimately where I'm getting. Right. You could say, look, this company offers this. This company offers that. This is what it would look like if, you know, and that's what you can do for uh, clients and their advisors. Correct. Yeah, okay. exactly. And, 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 and to your point, you know, you know there, there are no commission kind of index annuities that really meet clients' needs, too, because they have that principal protection and a part of the upside, right? Again, better than, you know, in, in, for the long-term tax deferral can be better than, yeah. you know, investing in bonds, right? Um, so, again, there's, there's different products depending on your, your – again, I would avoid the – I mean, when you say income annuities, because if you're getting a fixed amount, they're usually – the insurance company's charging you for that. And right. What they're charging you isn't really – you're not really getting the benefit for it. Um, so, again, it's just being wary of certain things. Can can you uh, look in people's if they got variable annuities? Is that something you can do too? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's something I, I – I, you know, I strongly, you know, recommend not doing um, variable annuities because, look, you could invest in that same yep. index, you know, outside and it, you get the long-term capital gain. So why would you do that inside an annuity? Like for what for, for what purpose and get higher tax at a higher rate? Like it doesn't well, make sense. Here's a case I've had a million times a Sunday. A guy has, a, again, guy's gender neutral, but a guy has a variable annuity. We'll just say it's 250000 in cash value. Uh, and it's got a death benefit of 200,000 bucks. And, and you know, he's got a 1.35 M&E charge. And, and I just, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking this is, this is insane because he's literally paying, you know, 3,000, $4,000 a year for a life insurance that he'll never use. Or if he does use it, it might pay out all of 20,000 bucks if he dies on the market's tank. But on that, yeah. it's completely, it's completely. All these just, riders. Are, yeah. Say again. Yeah, all these riders are just not worth it. It's it, 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 it like it's, it's, you're just needing a fear, like oh my god, I need this, I need this. Like, but again, it's not. First of all, you don't really need it, and two, they're charging you way too much for it. No, uh, well, okay, but that's again somebody. So again, if I'm looking at a client, he's got life insurance needs, and he has a variable annuity. We can say, Rajiv, you know, I, I I'm not even licensed on this stuff anymore, and I don't know enough in terms of analyzing the enforced illustration. But we can turn that over to you, and you could say okay, this is what we're looking at so we can at least make a good decision on what the next steps would be for a variable annuity right. life. And, okay, um, right. that's pretty good. How about second-to-die policies? I am a big fan of second-to-die policies too. Do they have any non-commissioned second-to-die policies out there now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so those are great because, like, look, the, the COI rates are going to be lower so you yes. to, because you have to wait till both of them die. And so for some of these tax-type plans, it really well, it makes, it, makes it look better. Um, so yeah, again, it depends on your your strategy, what you're trying okay. to do. 
Uh, and folks, just a second of die policy is simply my wife and I, Charlotte and I, I'm 48, my wife is 44. And so we're writing a life insurance on two insured. And that essentially, I'm going to die first because I'm a man and I'm older. But when I die, it doesn't pay out until she dies. That's what a second to die life insurance policy is. It only yeah, pays yeah. out the Both death of the second spouse, which means yeah. you're not providing the surviving spouse a death benefit. It is only going to the heirs of the second spouse, be it the church or be it your kids, whoever you want. Yeah. But because it doesn't pay on the death of the first, it's a lot cheaper uh, a lot of times than just actually getting on myself simply because there's more of a likelihood that I would die. And so uh, <laughs> from a yeah. state creation, it's it's a wonderful thing. To, I Correct. love that. Correct. Correct. Yeah, for a state, especially for the state. Yeah, it's really good. And then, it, it, all right, so let me ask you another question on trust, like, because we do talk a lot of people who have islets and uh, life insurance where the trustees, and I know for a fact half these people don't know what the hell they got. That would be so a case that, that you could, go ahead. So, so that's exactly what I'm trying to get in with is like trustees of islets. So like, yeah. look, you have a hundred policies. Hey, guess who really understands life insurance? Hey, you know, like, so let's, you know, we have a report, we have a universal, uh, uh, you know, the, Uniform Prudent Investor Act, which kind of like covers everything. Like, what are your risks? How does this compare to other things in the market? It really acts as a fiduciary. Yeah. Um, that we say, well, look, what's your risk profile? What are you trying to do? And it kind of has most of those kind of embedded in the report. Um, so I'm really trying to go after those kind of islets, you know, because um, that this is where, like, look, I'm an expert. You're just managing. Yep. Let me show you how to help your client. And let me add to that too, Rajiv, is that if you're the trustee of a life insurance policy that doesn't perform, uh, you're on the hook. Uh, the beneficiaries can sue you mm -hmm. and they will right. because whenever there's money at stake, I'm telling you right now, I've seen this happen a million times. People fight over the frigging curtains of mom's house. I mean, that's yeah. just a fact. Families get, and, and if you didn't do your due diligence, and I've seen it, I always say of a trustee of an Ill, uh, irrevocable life insurance trust, I say, when's the last time we got an enforced illustration? And they're like, uh, uh, uh. And I say, yeah, yeah that's not good. Um, and that's bad. So if you're a trustee because you think you're helping out mom, and you're not doing your due diligence, and let's just say you have some siblings or you have some uh, nieces and nephews who aren't at or maybe at odds for whatever reason. If they don't get what they feel is theirs, they're going to come after you. And I, I just can I, Rajiv, I used to do seminars all up and down the East Coast and telling people, they say, oh, my family's great. I said, they're great until the money's at hand where they yeah. thought they're going to get X and they're only getting Y. And things change drastically. The funny thing, Rajiv, being a financial planner, it makes you paranoid by nature. You know what I'm saying? It's just we're a paranoid bunch. But just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people are not out to get you. All right. So that's what I always say. Yeah, I'm paranoid, funny. but that doesn't mean things aren't going to happen wrong. Um, yeah. All right. So what, uh, how, how do people, so tell me about your real quick and what you get out of here, your firm. So uh, what's your firm and how do people get a hold of you, Rajiv? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, my, my firm's Colva Insurance Services. You can, you know, uh, email me directly at rajiv.rebello at colvaservices.com. Is that co like um, C-O-L-V-A, Colva? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then services. So it's all one word. Okay. Um, that's actually the best, best way to reach me is through, through, through email. Um, you can check out our, our site to see some of our services at www.colvaservices.com. Okay. Um, th that's generally the best way to, to get a hold. Uh, if you want to call directly, it's 800-561-4028. Now I'll put a link to the show notes and everything too, so people can uh, can look up your website. And, and folks, uh, now let me ask a question, Rajiv. If, a, if a, just a consumer is looking at maximizing their estate and you know maybe a radiologist looking at reducing taxes from bonds, can they call you directly or do they have to work through a financial advisor? No, they, they can call me directly. Okay. Um, I, I rarely get that, but yeah, it is usually through you know financial advisors. Yeah, but that could happen. Okay, so you yeah, could yeah, represent yeah, a consumer. Okay. And then um, and you said you're thinking about doing a podcast here pretty soon. You know, I, again, I want to kind of get in. That's kind of I was like, oh, when you said that, it was just uh, happened to be good timing. Um, yeah. yeah, trying to figure out how do I get these these concepts across to different people. You know, incorporate videos into it as well. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, I'm just trying to learn that that side of it, the, the social media side. Uh, so I'm more the analytical type. So I just this takes a little bit of time for me to figure it out. Well, that's good stuff. And uh, we certainly need more quality folks out there doing podcasts and doing videos. I'm telling you, especially on the video side, Rajiv, it's all infinite banking all the time. And I just, uh, and again, I'm not saying it can't work. I'm just saying if you don't fund that puppy strong in the front end, it is going to be a tax nightmare. Just real quick, what happens on the taxes if the policy lapses after you've been taking a loan? Can you just uh, scare people 
a little bit in there because there's some serious tax consequence in that regard. Yes. So, so, so you're owed. I mean, the the, the, the loan is considered uh, again. You're you're owed taxes on that uh, on on the difference between the you know you know what, what the surrender value is versus the loan, right? Um, so you could end up canceling it and still still owe the government money. So. It's a really tricky. So you really need to make sure when you take a loan, like, look, I'm going to keep this policy in force. Exactly. Otherwise, there are, are additional issues you take you need to take in consider, into consideration. I, and folks, so we'll wrap up here, but I just want to be very clear there that uh, life insurance is a valuable, valuable tool. And just because everybody and their mom talks about life insurance negatively doesn't mean it's true. It just doesn't. There is wonderful reasons to use life insurance. My experience is I've seen the cases where it works well. Unfortunately, that's few and far between, not because life insurance is bad or universal life insurance or whole life insurance. It's just the way it was set up initially with ignorant agents. That's a fact uh, who told and promised stuff they couldn't deliver to ignorant uh, consumers. And and that's sad, but that's the, the truth of the matter. The life insurance concept when used correctly is a wonderful tool. I'm, j- I'm telling you right now, I have whole life policies on my kids, on myself. I got second eye policies. Um, I, I just, I, it's, it's just, a, especially like Rajiv was talking about for a bond replacement strategy. I'm not going to say you should do that, but man, I'm telling you, there is some big benefits to that regard for sure. So don't overlook life insurance and say, oh, I'm not going to be sold it. Cause Rajiv just said, you can buy it without commissions and surrender charges, which means that you could buy the policy today, five years later, say, I don't want this anymore. Cancel it, get your money back or whatever it's worth. As opposed to like he was saying that 50% of the people lost all their money. Well, hey, Rajiv, money, but they, they lost a, a good, you know, right. Lost good a good amount because of surrender charge and the commissions. And so they didn't get, they didn't make even, they didn't break even. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, Rajiv, this is fantastic, man. I appreciate it. I'll put all these links in the show notes. And folks, if you have any questions for me, let me know. Just go to uh, Rajiv's website with any questions for him. And uh, Rajiv, I appreciate your time here today, man. All right. Thanks again for having me. Appreciate it. Got it.